Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Masters of mm -hmm. We are here today with Joshua Seth. Joshua, welcome. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. What an honor to be part of the mm -hmm universe. <laughs> yes, exactly. You are an mm human for sure. Um, but you are a camera confidence coach, I believe, and a voice acting coach. Give us a little bit of uh, background on and what you're up to and how you spend your day. I call myself a coach secondarily, like of necessity, essentially, because the need exists. But my background is I'm a pretty well-known voice actor. I've, for 20 years, I've been the voice of about 100 anime and animated TV shows and movies. Uh, and I tour as a keynote speaker and corporate entertainer at conferences, partly propelled by the modicum of fame that that affords. And the keynote that I do is on communication skills. So when everything shut down at the beginning of the pandemic, it, that was a pretty natural transition to, to speak about how to show up better on mic and on camera in this little box instead of on a stage. And in fact, that was the first virtual presentation I ever did was for something called the Million Dollar Roundtable Global, which I was supposed to go to physically do in Dubai. And I did here from my desk at home instead. And then I was sold on the virtues of virtual events. Yeah, well, we've, we've got some uh, fun clips of you using mm -hmm over the past year. Um, walk us through a little bit about when you discovered mm -hmm and how it fit into this sort of shift to uh, working from home and, and being a sort of virtual presence um, instead of being a in-person presence. Certainly, well, I was, speaking and presenting on this topic using a variety of tools and things were changing so quickly. I mean, the growth of Zoom at the beginning of the pandemic, for instance, uh, was exponential and it became ubiquitous within a few months. But prior to things shutting down, only people in specialized industries even knew of its existence. And then suddenly your grandparents were on Zoom with you. But yeah, as you well know, it was very static and there needs to be a lot of engagement in order to keep people coming back to this format and also to take away some good learning moments at the end of it as well. So with the advent of tools like mm -hmm, I was able to dispense with several extra screens that I had brought in to make these sorts of things happen. For instance, there is a, there's a product called Ecamm, if I may mention other things outside of Sure. Mm -hmm. So, so I would put together, let's say my slide presentation on an iPad, connect the iPad to Ecamm as a virtual camera, put myself on another camera. I have a standing desk here. I'd have another iPad set up to, to bounce, to bounce my own image off of the screen of the teleprompter so that I could see what I was doing. And then I would physically scroll through the slides on a separate screen. I had so many screens going that when mm -hmm happened, I thought well, I can just get away with all from all of this, put together each presentation, whether it was a show, I've done something like 150 virtual magic shows for corporations, or whether it was a, a keynote speech on communication skills. So simple to just put the presentation together one time in mm -hmm, and I wasn't using it for the purposes of not being there live, for instance. I wasn't using it for that benefit. I was using it to standardize my slides and movie snippets and other, other assets and elements of the presentation in a really organized fashion so that I could have all this dynamism going on without physically having to move around and, and manipulate all these different screens. That was the, the huge game changing benefit of mm -hmm to me was just to collapse everything down to one screen, one piece of software and do everything internally there. Yeah. Yeah. But in, and also in terms of sort of efficiency and simplifying, one of the things I've remarked about your presentations with mm -hmm is how simple they are. Uh, and including the one that's playing right now is I think you've done an amazing job of using a really simple visual aid, but you really embody that idea that you are the center of attention. You are the kind of authority of the slide. And it's not 
you're not sort of a small head in the corner somewhere. Um, it, it's it's a powerful does, tool. Yeah. Does that speak to your sort of what how you coach people? It's it's a worldview of minimalism, and if you can continue to strip things away to the essential elements, you're moving in the right direction. So when you have a powerful tool like mm -hmm, that can do so many things, I can I can fade myself in and out. I can make myself big. I, right now in this presentation, I could flip myself around. I could we could be changing rooms with every topic, but it's distracting to the viewer. So I do think less is more. At the same time, those few elements that I choose to use in a presentation should be really well thought out and well executed. Like the background that you're showing right there, right there. That's, that's a room that I actually created in another piece of software called Canva, downloaded and re-uploaded into mm -hmm as a, as a user customized room. So it's tempting to use all of the tools that mm -hmm makes available, but it's generally not a good idea. It's much better idea to like, if you're using the big hands, use it once, maybe twice, not throughout the presentation. And that, thought process would extend to every aspect of your presentation. Right. What are, yeah. So simple. So there's a message here of simplifying so you don't confuse your audience. Um, what other, what are your sort of top three go-to kind of recommendations for somebody starting to improve their, their video presence? Okay. I'll make them up right now. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Number one, stand or sit up be posturally aware in other words so it's very ah, <laughs> it's very easy to, to slouch it's very yeah. it's very easy to get casual when you're working from home because there isn't anybody else at least with me there isn't anybody else here right now but that is a big part of the authority that you are conveying is your body language right we know that traditionally it's thought that 93 percent of Communication is nonverbal, tone of voice, and body language. A big part of that being the way that you are standing, the way that you are using your hands and your arms, and the the tilt of your head, your eye level, how how high up in the frame are you? You know, all these things speak to your body language on camera. So that would be number one. Number two would be there you go, perfect slide. The tone of voice. Do vocal warm ups and breathing warm ups before you begin a presentation so that you sound like the best version of yourself because your voice is an instrument following along with the slide from my presentation in the background there your voice is an instrument you wouldn't play an instrument without warming up that instrument yet we begin to talk for long periods of time on a video call or a virtual presentation like this without warming up so warm up your voice as well as well as be aware of your physicality because that also influences the breath support and the quality of your tone of voice and therefore the emotional connection that you make with other people when you do speak. And the third one would be spend a little on your tech. I know it's very popular to say, oh, you can do this without spending more than a hundred dollars or whatever. Why? This is your professional presence. Go ahead. <laughs> do that for yourself as you would if you were in an office. You're not going to go to an office and, and sit in a folding chair. There's going to be a nice, I've got a nice Herman Miller Aeron chair that I'm sitting on. Now, that said, you don't have to spend a lot of money, but you should if it's important for the quality of the work that you are doing. This is a $20 wired mic with a very long cord on it going into a very nice mixer is the thing. So I've tested so many different mics and I get a better sound, a more consistent sound when I'm moving around on camera. I'm sitting right now, but normally if I were giving a presentation, I'd be standing and moving around. I have found that I get a more consistent sound with a wired lapel mic, which cost me $20. However, go going into a mixer, which that's an additional expense, but it's well worth it because you can, you can, boost the low range, you can eliminate the tinny sound and it doesn't take up any processing power on your computer because I'm recommending a physical mixer. And, that, and I have other mics you, that you can't see now because of the green screen, but I, you know, I have a much better large diaphragm condenser mic for when I'm say voicing a movie, which I'm still doing remotely now. 
you don't have to spend a lot of money is what I'm saying. But if it's going to get you a better quality result in your work, I think you should. I think everybody that's that's doing this seriously should invest in some good lights and a good mic at a and a good desk, standing desk preferably, at a bare minimum, and not try to, to pinch pennies simply because you're working from home. It's still the quality of your work. I like that. So to recap, posture. Number two would be uh, the sort of audio quality of your voice. Uh, warm up your voice. Warm have up good, your voice. Good vocal tone. Vocal tone. And then third is uh, invest a little bit into your technologies so that uh, absolutely where appropriate where appropriate not right. all across but just throwing money at the problem isn't the solution sure my green screen is actually fantastic it's just a, a sheet it's just a green sheet that i tacked up to the wall with thumbtacks because every time i tried to hang it on on a some sort of a bar there were issues air conditioning would kick on and then it would flutter for instance mm -hmm. different sorts of issues with stretching it thumbtack it straight to the wall it's flat there's no problems that costs next to nothing as well but the lights cost hundreds of dollars the it, it, it just depends where but the investment and taking a little bit of time to sort it out the best possible solution for yourself is time well spent because yeah. i'm sure you would agree we're at the very beginning of remote work and virtual presentations. So spending the time on this now is going to pay dividends for the rest of your career. That's right. Yeah, no, I like that. I really like the folding chair analogy. I think that's, I think that's a great, a, a great analogy. You wouldn't like, you wouldn't just go out and buy a folding chair for your home office because it's the cheapest thing. Uh, and, and I think also one of the things that I've experienced is sometimes I will buy, um, like a, a cheaper thing when I'm just getting started. And then once I get comfortable and I realize, oh yeah, like I, I do want a more expensive microphone or I do want something a little bit better than, then I, I can make the investment after I've sort of experimented first. Yeah. That's fair. And I went through several cameras before I found the camera that I like, although I'm loving, I'm, I'm loving the camera in the new iMac. I'm using the new M1 iMac with the 1080p built in camera right now. And for everything except for an actual live professional presentation, like a, a virtual keynote or show for everything else. I just use this now. It's so convenient and it looks great. Otherwise I use the Sony ZV-1. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think your point that this is just the beginning, we're in like uh, the day one of this massive shift um, to our increased video presence means, means that there's also going to be a lot of, um, enhancements, you know, our, our laptops are going to have better cameras in them. Uh, you know, just in general, I think that the technology companies, the equipment that we buy will just get better and better just in the same way that like all the cameras in our, you know, iPhones and Google pixels and stuff has gotten better year over year. So, uh, certainly. Yeah. And, and the, and the need has now been established to be widespread. I, I'll give you an example in the meeting and event industry, which is, that's really how I make my living, the, the coaching, the workshops, the, all of that I put together because I was sitting at home, really. I was sitting at home when the, when the meeting and event industry shut down and things that I'd never been able to do, like train people in the use of their voice, whether it's for voiceovers or presentations, suddenly I had time to put together a, a 30 day Kajabi course and run workshops and do all these kinds of things that I had the time to do because I was sitting at my desk. Then everything came together when I was asked to MC a three-day virtual conference. So this, this is to your point about how we're at day one. So I spent about a year doing this from home on my own, piecing things together. And I started MCing conferences because somebody needs to glue the different elements of one of these multi-hour, multi-day events together. You've got lots of different speakers and content segments, but who's the face of it? Hopefully me. I was doing it at home and then about a year ago, about a year into the pandemic, British Petroleum asked me to fly out to LA to a TV studio where everybody was socially distanced and they had a full crew and I'm back in an environment that I had been used to before things shut down, except now the audience was remote and the speakers were remote. And the only people that were in the room were me as the MC and the crew. 
And this was the beginning of hybrid. And since then I've done every variation of hybrid that you can think of. The audience is in the theater and I'm on a big screen, but I'm home. Or I'm in a conference room and the audience is in a bunch of different rooms and they all have screens with a mic set up in front of a laptop so that if they want to come up and interact or ask a question, they can. Or just every, nobody has really figured out exactly what the best practice is for these hybrid events, but I've seen statistics from the meeting, meeting planners and the meeting and events industry indicating that something like 75% of all events with a budget, good sized events, will be hybrid going forward because of the complexities of international travel, because of the time and expense involved in getting to the event. And so most likely the, the VIPs, the speakers, the movers and the shakers, the, the C-suite people will be in the room at a lot of these events moving forward. And those that would benefit from the content but don't necessarily need to be there for networking purposes will still be consuming it, but remotely. And this is the future of, of my industry, of this meeting and event industry. So therefore, all executives, all C-suite personnel, all speakers, everybody that has sales and leadership professionals, everybody that has a message that they need to magnify in this way is going to have to get good on camera. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what was a breakthrough moment for you where you felt like, oh, wow, this is different than being in person. The the, the sort of virtual keynote is its own thing. Um, how are they alike and how are they different? The, the keynote, that was a pretty smooth transition because you're just, you're talking, right? It feels weird because you don't get the applause. You don't get the sounds of the people in the room. It was the show that it was really hard for me personally to wrap my head around this. I'm, I know I'm supposed to be the expert and the master here and say it, it came immediately. It did not. In fact, I wrote an article for this international mystery entertainers, variety entertainers publication, magicians mostly, saying, I'm never going to do a Zoom show. They suck because the whole point of live entertainment is the connection that you create between the person on stage, the entertainer, and the audience. And that connection is lost when, when you're on Zoom. That's how I felt initially. Six months went by. And these tools, many of which I've mentioned here, started to appear in the marketplace. And I and other innovative performers around the globe all started to get together in private chat rooms on Facebook, for instance, and share these ideas and innovations that we were coming up with. And it, it was a slow process, but it was six months before I would even consider the idea. And it was another couple of months before I started to feel like what I was doing with it was any good and it was good enough to want to share with people outside of friends and family and the industry. And then eventually it got to the point where in certain regards, in certain ways, the virtual show is better than the in-person show because there are things that can be done with technology or hidden outside the frame, let's say, or because there's a green screen in the background, this lends itself to creating effects that are not possible or would be very expensive and difficult if it were done in front of a live audience. So it required a complete recreation of the show. This is all about the show that I'm speaking about right now. It, it re required a complete rethinking of what is the show going to be? How is it going to work? What is the point of it? How are we going to create this connection and what technology would be used in order to do it? But once those questions were posed and answered, something new was born that is really gratifying and a lot of fun to do. And I, I hope I'll always do, which is, which is to, to use a lot of different elements, diff mm -hmm, e cam, green screen, zoom, what have you in, in ways that, that create a remarkable, engaging, interactive experience. And I honestly didn't see that as being possible when the pandemic began. And in some ways it wasn't possible because these tools didn't yet exist. Right, exactly. Yeah, there's only gonna be more and more tools just as our equipment gets better and better too. Well, actually- but, 
but you have to have you have to have something to say too you have to have the the, the technology is not enough you you have to be able to show up and use that technology with your expertise but yes using your voice and using your visage in a way that will cross that digital divide and make an emotional impact on the viewer and the listener on the other side totally i yes exactly all the tools in the world is not going to tell your great tell make you a great storyteller you still have to you have to still have something to say but but speaking of something to say you have a book uh and it's about thinking differently. Um, can you share a little bit more about what this book's about and, and how it represents kind of your approach to, you know, your work? Sure. Yeah. It's this. It's this is a distillation of everything I talk about in my keynotes, and I wrote it for my kids, and I wrote it pre-pandemic because I was flying around the world so much to these events. It's, bit morbid but i just felt like you know the odds are against me here like at one point like something's going to happen a plane's going to fall out of the air i'm going to get in a, you know that's in the wrong taxi in the wrong part of town who knows i want to be able to pass on my accumulated wisdom for what it's worth to my kids i really wrote it as a guidebook for success for them but then it served as a blueprint for a high having a high performance mindset for people in business. And that's really what I speak about. And I know we're getting to that time where I get to give it away for free. So yes, you can get it by going to joshuaseth.com and clicking on free, download it, see what you think. It's also on audible. If you'd like me to read it to you while you drive around on your busy day. Amazing. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you a little bit about Digimon because you've been with the media franchise Digimon for 20 years. Tell us a little bit about that experience, where it's going and how it's opened up opportunities in other places. Certainly, it, it's, it's been a great run. <laughs> I, I started all of this when I was a film and television production student at NYU and I had a radio program, WNYU, New York City. And I put together a demo and got a Hollywood agent and then moved out to Hollywood to begin my career. And then it was years before I had a starring role on a hit TV series, which was Digimon. In the intervening time, that's when I developed talents and skill sets that I'm still using today. It was because of the difficulties in getting recognized in Hollywood that I was forced to innovate and develop and get outside my comfort zone because I thought I already had everything that I needed. But at that point when Digimon hit, it was the number one animated TV show on, on Saturday morning television. And then we continued and we've done eight movies. And where it relates to this is that I was actually filming the, well, recording, it's voice recording, the last movie, the eighth movie in Hollywood, the day that Eric Garcetti shut the city down. For the it was the first city in the US to have the restaurants closed, if you'll recall. And that happened when I was in the air flying out there to record that movie. And by the time I landed, that had all happened and everybody's running around the studio holding the, the scripts out at arm's length, like, don't get near me. Don't. Nobody knew what, you know, what was going to happen. They ended up shutting the production down and I had to fly back home and record the rest of the movie from home using a $99 microphone that I had at the time. And, and, and that's when this journey to developing a proper virtual studio began for me. Along the way, I developed some notoriety in, in this field as a, as a voice actor. And over the years, I've, I've made lots of appearances at Comic Cons. And, and there are thousands, I would assume, <laughs> hundreds certainly, but definitely pot potentially thousands around the world of these anime and pop culture type conventions. And I used to fly around the world to do them. I've taken some great trips to New Zealand and Australia and, and so forth to. to just speak about voiceovers and voice acting and using your voice. And now I do them virtually. I've been doing these virtual signings, basically what we're doing right now, except that we're talking about, you know, hi, I play Ty, the leader of the Digimon and how you could use it to, to change your voice and be in animation. But even that has, even that field has been disrupted and expanded through virtual presentations because people that could never afford to get to one of the conventions that I was doing in say San Diego or Auckland, just 
could sign on to the live stream and be a part of it for free instantaneously anywhere in the world. Amazing. Amazing. And it is. let's say, I don't know, not that you have a crystal ball, but three years from now, what do you think your, what do you, what are you looking ahead to in like three years? Where do you think you'll be? Where do you think we'll be? Where will all this, I know you said the trend is like, everybody's thinking hybrid, but are you, you think there's even bigger trends that are going to influence us that we don't see now? Without a doubt. In fact, my answer will be couched in not knowing except for that, that we can know that the, the pace of innovation will accelerate and the changes that are yet to come have not yet been conceived by any of us. So who would have thought five years ago that we would be where we are right now? People always ask, well, what is your five-year plan? We should all just say, we don't know. We should all just strive to be a slightly better version of ourselves each day than we were yesterday and do a little bit better work than we did previously. In fact, that's one of the takeaways in, in my book about thinking differently is instead of setting these grandiose goals for ourselves within which there is no joy because when you achieve that goal, well, then you're on to another one. If the goal is one of continuous learning and continuous improvement, then that's a lifelong quest that never ends. And you can always stay engaged and curious and creative. And that's what I've, uh, that's, that's, that's a way of being that I've found natural for myself. It keeps me happy and, and engaged and excited to show up every day. My answer is long winded and it, and it ends up being who knows, who knows where it's going to, to go. But if, if we adopt that mindset, it's sort of like being a surfer, right? Like we'll be ready for those waves. Although we don't know exactly when they are coming, we know the motion of the ocean, the direction in which they are going. And so we can continue to flow forward with them. Joshua, I think that's a great place to end. That was, uh, that was really well said. And, uh, I, I definitely agree with you that, uh, we gotta be ready to catch the next waves because we don't know when they're coming, but we know that they are coming. So thank you so much for your time. Um, awesome to have your insights and thanks for being such a champion of, uh, humans, uh, and being part of our community. And thanks so much. Appreciate it. Absolutely. It's been a great resource. I look forward to seeing what you guys innovate in those years to come. I'm sure I'll be here for it. Awesome. Thank you. Bye-bye.